difficulties come from. Well, I want you to know that if unless you understand the real purpose of life, first of all, life seems meaningless. Why should I keep on going? Why should I care? Why should I get out? Why should I teach a class or pastor a church? Life becomes meaningless. If you don't know the point of life, then life is meaningless. Your work is meaningless. The family that you have is meaningless. All that you do has no purpose if you don't know the purpose for life. In verse 2, he said, vanity He said, vanity of vanities, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. And he said that twice. He repeated it. He's he's emphasizing the emptiness of life. Everything is a soap bubble. Everything that you have striven for, everything that you would hope for, becomes nothing but a, a, a mist in the morning. It's here today and gone tomorrow. Everything I do has no meaning if there isn't some kind of point to life. Point to life. Now, if we're just animals, if we just exist on this earth, and that existence is all there is, and then we die, then life is meaningless. I get told by so many people who want to argue with me about the fact that we're just here on this earth, and we die, and we stay in the ground. Well, Solomon thought that too for a while. But the fact of the matter is, if that's all you've got is the life you're living right now, and as you get older, there's less purpose, then this life is meaningless. If we don't have eternity in view, then all of our sacrifices, all of our labor, all of our life is really of none accord. It's, if it's true that there's nothing in life except what you have right here and now, then life is vain. Life is empty. Life is meaningless, and that's where the majority of this world stand. The second thing that he talked about was life is tiresome. Unless you have some purpose in your life, life is tiresome. If you don't know the point of life, if you don't have an answer to the question of what is the purpose of life, then life is tiresome. So many times I have older folks that have retired say, I don't know why I get up in the morning. My mama, sometimes when I call her, she says, well, I only get up because I know you're going to call me. Otherwise, I'd stay in the bed. So the fact of the matter is that without a purpose in your life, many times it becomes tiresome. Here, Solomon says something very important in verse number four. In verse four, he says, one generation passeth away and another generation cometh, but the earth abideth forever. In other words, he's pointing out how nothing changes in nature. Sun goes down, sun comes up. We finish winter, the leaves are going to come back. There's nothing that seems to change in nature. The sun rises, the sun sets. The river flows toward the sea, but the sea never fills up because the sun evaporates the water, carries it back over the land, and it rains and it flows back down the river, back to the sea. He says what is what has been true is, is, is a repetitive thing, and life becomes tiresome. Life becomes tiresome. If there's no meaning in the cycle of life, there's no meaning in the work that we do. There's no meaning in the years that we live. If that is life, and that's all there is, then life becomes tiresome. Tiresome. The third thing he talks about in verse 8 and 9, life without some purpose becomes unfulfilling, unfulfilling. Now, when you don't understand the point of life, it seems unfulfilling. Look at what he says in verse 8 and 9. All things are full of labor. Man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied and seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done. And there is no new thing under the sun. In other words, he's saying there's nothing that I can find that is satisfying in my life. No matter how much I see, no matter how I, I, I want to see more. No matter how much I hear, I want to hear more. Folks, this is a description of a heart that is not in fellowship with the Lord. He's saying from a human perspective. I can't see enough to satisfy me. I can't hear enough 
to satisfy me. He says, a matter of fact, hell has been described in its greatest definition as eternal separation from God. Can you imagine your life here on the earth not being in touch with the Lord? But what's worse than that is an eternity which is separated from God, and that's hell. When people talk about their life in these terms, that there is no fulfillment in life, no joy in their life, uh, uh, no, no satisfaction in their existence, then it's because they're seeking satisfaction in the wrong places. If I had more money, I'd be happy. If I had a better spouse, I'd be happy. If I could own a bigger house, I'd be happy. And yet every time we acquire those things, we still find that hole in our heart because we're seeking for satisfaction in the wrong place. Satisfaction can only be found in God and knowing the point of life. You'll only be satisfied. If you find your satisfaction in God who gives you the purpose for your life. I've been asked in recent years if I was going to retire. I said, what would I do? I enjoy people. I enjoy uh, speaking and preaching and teaching. That's the purpose why I'm here. I come from a long line of preachers in my life who continue to preach in their 80s. And one, even up to the time he died at age 94. You see, when God calls you to do something and he gives you the purpose, that's the reason that you're here. Now, we find here a very important thing. You know, I read something this week. I read the other day that the average American today, the average American today will turn the channels on their TV 350,000 times in their life. That's an interesting statistic. But you know what that's yet? It shows me that nobody's ever satisfied. We're always looking for something else on the TV. And that's true in the church. Why are so many people going from church to church, spouse to spouse, family to family? Why is it that the job to job? I've been a supervisor. Many of you have been a supervisor. And I'm hearing this more today than ever before. People just don't want to work. They come, they take a job, and they're gone. They don't want to stick it up. They don't want a career. Many times bosses are the same way. They don't want the same employees. I've been the HR counselor for several industries in this area that use temporary uh, temps just simply because they don't want permanent employees. They only want them for 90 days. So, folks, we live in a day and age when people are just not satisfied with the church, with their preacher, with the Lord, with their job, with their money, with their position, with their car, with their house. They're just not satisfied. Not satisfied. No matter how much you see, you never see enough. No matter how many channels you turn, you're never happy with what's on TV. The fourth thing I want you to see is without a real purpose in life, life seems insignificant. Life seems insignificant. Take a look beginning in verse number 9. In verse 9 through 11, he says, All things are full of labor. Man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be. And that which is done, is that which shall be done. And there is no thing under the sun, no new thing under the sun. Is there anything whereof it may be said, See, this is new. It hath been already of old time, which was before us. There is no remembrance of former things. Neither shall there be any remembrance of things that are to come with those that shall come after. In other words, he's saying, No one remembers what has happened in the past. And no one in the days to come will remember what happens between now and then. He's talking about the fact that fame is fleeting. There's an old saying that if you don't remember history, you're doomed to repeat it. And so many times we see that in our own country. We forget what we've come through and we end up repeating it and having the same, uh, same conclusion. In this world, you can go from hero to zero. 
And so many times, the people that have lived and labored after they're dead and gone are forgotten. And a new generation comes in or a new group of people come in who don't even know or remember what you've done. The person who's the most popular rock star in all the world uh, uh, and around the world, foreign countries, it makes life seem very significant because they're so important. But then all of a sudden, years later, when they've had their last song, aren't even remembered by the generations that come along. Solomon again and again in the book of Ecclesiastes talks about the brevity of life. He talks about man's days on this earth being like your, your breath on a winter morning when you breathe and you see the smoke and then all of a sudden it disappears. It's there for a moment and then it's gone. It's insignificant. He says life is like that. It used to be I was young and now I'm old and I don't know where the days have gone. Life, he says, becomes insignificant. <coughs> and then he says life because of this, becomes uncontrollable. Let me go the right way here so we can keep up with it. Life becomes uncontrollable in verse 15. Uncontrollable. Verse 15, he talks about, he says this, he says, That which is crooked cannot be made straight, and that which is wanting cannot be numbered. In other words, he said, what's crooked can't be straightened. In other words, it can't be counted. It can't, it, it's worthless. You can't count on things that are not there. You can't straighten things which are crooked. What he's saying is there are things in life that are beyond your control. You can't straighten the crooked. You can't count something if it's not there. He's saying in your life you're going to find that some things are out of your control. I think all of us have hit something like that, whether it's the death of a loved one or maybe the loss of a job, or I could go on and on. We find in this life that some things, no matter how much we want it or how much we want it to change, will not change. They're uncontrollable. When you look at this world, you see the injustice of our justice system. You see the perpetual perpetualness of poverty. Uh, no matter what day and age we live in, generation after generation has its poor. You see our penal system as it fails to rehabilitate those that have been incarcerated. In all the programs for addictions, you find that those that go through the programs still end up back where they started with the addiction that caused them so much problem. You, so you have to ask yourself the question, what's the point? If the judicial system can't help and the educational system can't help and, the, and the, uh, the, the other systems in which we live are not changing people and this world is the same, what's the purpose? What's the point of life? If you don't know, then life becomes uncontrollable. Notice what Solomon did. He tried uh, to prepare for eternity. He said you've got to prepare to meet God. He said, you've got to find out what the real point of life is. Now, let's look at the places that Solomon looked to try to find out where the point of life is. First of all, he tried learning. He tried learning. Look down at verse 12. He tried learning. It says in verse 12, very simply, he said, he said in verse 12, I, the preacher, was king over Israel and Jerusalem. And I gave my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom concerning all things that was done under heaven. This sore travail hath God given to the sons of man to be exercised therewith. You know, over 25 years ago, I think it's been about 27 years now, I received the degrees from school that I had worked so long to receive. And I got the last degree that I graduated with, and I thought I knew everything about everything, only to find out that after 25 years of studying and all the graduate school, that I still hadn't learned some of the most important lessons that I needed in ministry and in life. Education it was a grievous task. All the tests, all the... Uh, books that I had to read and, and, and those that I had to write. It was grievous. It was hard work 
to do all of that. But here's what Solomon is saying. He's saying you can study all you want. You can explore and learn about the universe. You can take human education as far as it will go. But it still won't reveal to you the point of life. He said, I tried to learn everything I could learn. I tried to read all the books. I tried to keep a journal all my lessons. He said, I still didn't know the purpose of life. Education is good, folks. But education can't teach you the point of life. He tried learning, but it was grievous. It was grievous. And he still said, after all the learning I did, I still didn't know anything. You know what I call people like that? Eggheads. They are educated beyond their intelligence. And so many times we run into people that have multiple degrees like the curls in a pig's tail. It never makes the ham any better. They got all the degrees and they're dying by degrees. But they still don't know the purpose of life. You see, Paul said that mankind is always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of truth. He said that professing themselves to be wise, they become fools. Romans chapter 1 verse 22. Man's knowledge can never find God. Man's knowledge can never find God. So learning fails us if you're in search of the real reason for life. The second thing he tried was liquor. Liquor. Look at chapter 2 verse 3. He says in chapter 2, And verse 3, I sought in my heart to give myself unto wine, yet acquainting my heart with wisdom, and to lay hold on folly till I might see what was that good for the sons of men, which they should do under the heaven all the days of their life. He goes on to talk about how it, how it was nothing but, but folly and foolishness even to stay drunk and to try drugs. How many folks do I know that are trying all the latest and greatest drug just to find peace, to find solitude, to find, to find a, a real purpose in life, only to find that even the latest drug can't help them? So many people today try to avoid answering the question, what is the point of life? Does life even have any meaning? Do the drugs and the liquor and the alcohol give you a way of escape? That's what Solomon tried. He tried it for a while. He studied and study didn't help him. He tried liquor and it didn't help him. Thirdly, he said, I'll try luxury. I'll try luxury. Look at chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. He said in verse 8, I gathered me also silver and gold and the particular treasures of kings and of providences, I get me men singers and women singers, and the delight of the sons of men as musical instruments, and that of all sort. So I was great and increased more than all they that went before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me. All my, my wisdom, he said, remained, he was still wise. He thought, well, maybe the more toys I can get, the bigger winner I will be. And that's the, the more toys that, you know, the, the one who wins is the one who dies with the most toys. Well, that's what Solomon was saying. So he tried to get everything that he could in a material sense. And verse 4, all the way through verse 10 of this chapter, of chapter 2, speaks about uh, this exactly. But take a look particularly in verse 10. He said in verse 10, And whatsoever my eyes desired, I kept not from them. I withheld not my heart from any joy, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was my portion and my labor. He said, whatever I saw, I got. Whatever I saw, I bought it. It was mine. I made it mine. Then look at chapter 2, beginning in verse 4. I'm going the wrong way again. In chapter 2 and verse 4, he said this, He said, I made me great works. I built houses. I planted vineyards. And I I made gardens and orchards. And I planted trees in them of all kinds of fruit. I made pools of water to water thereby the wood and bringeth forth trees. 
I got servants and maids and had servants born in my house. Also, I had great possessions of great small cattle above all that were in Jerusalem before me. And then he went on to say, I gathered also silver and gold and the peculiar treasures of kings and providences. I got men singers and women singers and the delights of the son of men and musical instruments of all sorts. Man, that's luxury. He had everything his money could buy. When the queen of Sheba came to visit with Solomon, she saw the magnificence of his power. She saw the stables with all the horses. Terry and I have been to the stables of Solomon. She saw all the horse stables that he possessed. She noticed the buildings that he built and all the gardens that he had, making up part of the seven wonders of the world. And she made this statement. She said, I heard about your wealth, but the half has not even been told. The Queen of Sheba said that the worlds could never describe the wealth of Solomon. So he had everything his heart desired. Solomon was a very wealthy man. He said, but even though I was so wealthy, he said, wealth didn't bring me peace. He said, wealth didn't feel what's on the inside. He said, wealth didn't give me meaning and purpose in life. He said, I had it all, and I did everything I wanted to do, but I still was not happy. It didn't bring me joy. It didn't tell me what is the point of living. He also tried lust. He tried lust. He said, well, learning didn't help. Liquor didn't help. Luxury didn't help. Let me try lust. And in chapter 2, verse 10, Solomon said, Whatsoever my eyes desired, I kept not from them. I withheld not my heart from any joy, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was the portion of my labor. So here he's talking about the pleasure of lust. If my eyes saw it and I wanted it, I went after it. Now you have to remember, here's a man who was married to 700 women. He used up a lot of chapstick kissing them goodnight, didn't he? <laughs> 700 wives. On top of that, 300 concubines. A thousand women he had to answer to. And he said, even with all of the lust in this world, I still didn't find the meaning of life. He was a man who lived with the heathenistic philosophy. The greatest thing in life is that which brings me the most pleasure. That was his philosophy. Now, he tried it, but it still didn't work. When you look through chapter 2, sometimes just read it and highlight every time you see the word I. I. Because you're going to see it multitudinous number of times. He gave into every lust of his flesh. He lived completely and totally for himself. He ended up saying this. He said, it is all empty. It is all meaningless. It is all useless. And it leaves me still hungering for the answer to my question. What is the purpose of life? What else did he try? He tried labor. He tried labor. Well, maybe if I just saturate myself in work, become a workaholic. He said, I'll try labor. See if that helps out. So in chapter 2, verse 17, he says, Therefore I hated life, because the work that is wrought under the sun is grievous unto me. For all is vanity and vexation of spirit. Yea, I hated all my labor, which I had taken under the sun, because I should leave it unto a man that shall, shall be after. Then he goes on to say, And who knoweth whether he shall be a wise man or a fool? Yet shall he have rule over all my labor wherein I have labored and wherein I have showed myself wise under the sun. This is also vanity. Therefore I went about to cause my heart to despair in all the labor which I took under the sun. Solomon says, look at what I highlighted in blue. He says, after all the labor I put in, all my savings, all my investments. He said, who knoweth whether he 
is coming after me will be a wise person or a foolish person. He said, I worked hard to get everything. I have done everything that, it, that, that has been asked of me to find some meaning in my labor. And I'm going to leave everything behind when I die. And who knows, but the, my heirs, my children, my grandchildren will not take and build on that, but become fools and spend it all. I find that to be true many times in life, that the children and the grandchildren of someone who has labored hard to take care of the family end up squandering everything. How many people do you know who could have been a blessing in the Lord's work? who could have been a blessing to the hungry, to the, those that are hungry and in need, those that could have helped sending the gospel around the world. But instead of doing that, they hoarded their money. They refused to give. They refused to, they just simply went into life trying to acquire more and more. Then when they left this life, and all that they had worked for, all that they had accumulated, the things that they had not done with it, they were gone in a very matter of just a short period of time. All that they had accumulated and not invested in the Lord's work was gone because of the foolishness of the generations to follow. What they had saved for, what they had tried to hold on to, was all gone. And that was what Solomon was saying here. He was saying, that's what's going to happen to me. Solomon died and his son destroyed the kingdom spent all of his money. On top of that, split the kingdom. Jeroboam and Rehoboam, who was Solomon's son, divided the kingdom after Solomon had spent all of his life to bring the nation of Israel to being the strongest kingdom in the world of that day. They divided it, and they ultimately were taken off into captivity. So he said this, labor didn't work. I buried myself in my job. And I accomplished and built all of this, and yet it meant nothing. So then what did he try? He tried the Lord. All the way to the end of the book, chapter 12, verse 13 and 14. Notice what he said. After trying all these things, he said, then I came to the conclusion. He said, let us hear the conclusion of the matter. Fear God, keep his commandments, for, life, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment and every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. So finally, he realized that the only thing that really matters in life, after trying all these other things, the only thing that mattered in life was what you're going, what you're, uh, going to be able to say when you stand before God one day and give a an account for the life that you live. God is going to bring every work into judgment, every act that you spent your life on. And so with that in mind, let's determine how we can prepare for that day. What can you do to be ready for the day that when God says, all right, let's open the book to your life and see what you spent your life on. First of all, you can prepare by knowing God. Knowing God, what's the point of life? I don't have to speculate about it because Paul has already told me in the book of Ephesians what the point of my life is. He says in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Then we go down to verse 10 of the same chapter. He says that in the dispensation of the fullness of time, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. If you read that same verse in the Living Bible, it says this was the purpose that when a time is right, he will gather us all together to be with him in Christ forever. The American Standard Version, same verse, says, with a view to the administration suitable to the fullness of the time, that is, the summed up of all things in Christ, things in the heaven, things that are on this earth. And then Paul goes in, in your Bible, he goes on to say in verse 11, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. 
How do you prepare for eternity? How do you get ready when your life comes to an end? How do you prepare for the life to come? Paul tells us, looking down through the centuries, looking down through the generations, that God could see and could see that you would be presented with the gospel and that you would say yes. And it says, God chose you before the foundations of the earth, knowing that when you were presented with the gospel, you would say yes. That in no way, by the way, takes away from freedom of choice. This is a doctrine not for the unsaved, but for the saved. If you accept salvation, you call and call on your life uh, that, that God calls in your life. The Bible says that you were chosen by him, the foundations of the world. And if you've not yet accepted the gift of God's salvation that he offers, the message that God gives you is whosoever will may come. D.O. Moody used to say it's like this. On this side of the door, we read the words whosoever will may come. And if we step through and accept that invitation, God, and look back at the door as God sees it, the door on the side that God sees is foreknown from the foundations of the, earth, of the world. God knew you would be saved. God knew that you would say yes. God knew before he ever created Adam and Eve that Earl Folks on October the 21st, 1961, would say yes when presented to the gospel that the rest of my life was in line with that direct knowledge of God. Now, what else does he say? You know, the Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So the first thing you need to do is know God. The second thing that you need to do is become like Christ. Become like Christ. We need to become just like Jesus. Because the character that you build, and I want you to understand this, the character that you build is what you're going to have and enjoy when you get into eternity. You see, what you do here on this earth changes heaven forever for you. Heaven's a perfect place, but it's not the same place. The Bible says there'll be some that will, that will shine with the brightness of the firmament because they've won people to the Lord. There's some that'll have many crowns and some that'll have no crowns at all. So heaven is not going to be the same place, but it's still a perfect place. So we see here that as we come to a knowledge of what God has for us, some people will say, well... If once saved, always saved, so it doesn't matter how I live. But the Bible doesn't teach that. The purpose is whatever character you build, whatever knowledge of Christ you gain, whatever works you do, you're sending them ahead into eternity. Amen. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 19, Jesus said, Lay not up for yourself treasures upon earth, where as moth and rust doth corrupt, and wherein thieves break through and steal. That's what you're going to have throughout all of eternity. And Paul says in Romans 8, 28 and 29, that all things in your life will work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. And then verse 29, he said, for whom the Lord foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. If you look at the Phillips translation of that verse, it says, for those who love God, Everything that happens fits into a pattern for good. For God chose us to bear the family likeness of his son, that he might be the eldest of many brothers. In other words, God decided that he would have a whole race of people that look like, act like, walk like, talk like, smell like the Lord Jesus Christ. What's the point of life? Why are you still here? The point of life is that everything that happens to us happens that we may become more like Christ. He says we know that all things work together for good. He didn't say everything was good. He says, but ultimately, everything that comes into our life will bring about that image of Christ. And it will be good. God is far more interested in our godliness than in our gifts. Folks, it's so important. 
That's why everything that happens has a point. It has a reason. It has a purpose. It has a meaning. It may be a senseless tragedy to us, and many times it often is, but God will one day make sense out of it all. A third reason that we're still here is to serve others. If God has a purpose in your life and chosen you for that purpose, then you need to understand that God wants you to serve. He wants you to serve other people. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. God all. God already, before the foundations of the world, chose you, knew your gifts, knew your talents, knew the job He wanted you to do, knew the family that you would be born into, and He gave us those gifts for the purpose of serving other people. We need to practice serving. We aren't here for ourselves. We aren't here to make ourselves happy. We're here to serve. And one reason Solomon had so much unhappiness in his life was because he did everything for self. He said, I build my vineyards. I build myself houses. I build this great kingdom. And the kingdom of self will always crumble. And when it crumbles, it will leave you empty. So how do you prepare? Know God. Become like Christ, serve others, but share your faith. What is God's purpose for every Christian? It is to share their faith. If you're not sharing your faith, you're living in vain. Paul said this in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 19, To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the work, the word of reconciliation. He's committed to every believer. He's committed to you. He's committed to me the message of reconciliation to tell the world that Jesus saves and that we can have a relationship with God. So what did we learn? We need to know God. We need to become like Christ. We need to serve others. And we need to share our faith. Did you know that we're only one generation away from paganism? I've seen it. Mama and Daddy go to church, bring the kids to church. The kids start going to stop going to church, and all of a sudden, their children never get saved. And Christianity is not spoken of. The sacrifice of Christ is not spoken of in a home that used to be in church. Paganism. If this generation doesn't tell the next generation about Jesus and the values of God's Word and pass on godliness, Christ-like ways of living, the next generation is never going to know it. Every, Every single one of us is an ambassador for Christ. We're here to serve other people. We're here to bring other people to God. We're here to share our faith with everybody we meet. That's why we're here. All of this in preparation for eternity. Because one day, when we stand before God, we're going to give an account for every single day that we were here on this earth, what we did or did not do for the Lord. That's a sobering thought. But that's the point of life. That's why God has left you. This life isn't all there is. Amen? There's more to come. This life is just preparing for what God has prepared for us in eternity. I heard somebody read this someplace. You're not ready to live until you have prepared to die. I thought about that. I mulled it over. You're not ready to live until you're prepared to die. And I changed it. Because I believe this. You're not ready to live until you have prepared to live for Jesus Christ. And have a purpose and a goal and a meaning in this life. Folks, that's the purpose of living. That's the purpose why God gives you another day. That's the reason why you're still here. And will continue to be here. Until God fulfills the purpose for you being here. And brings you home. To give an account 
of your life. Next week, when the bottom falls out, what should I do? When it seems like everything is not working, what should I do? Shall we stay?